Thank you, uh, John. I wish I could stay because uh, I've already learned from uh, so many people here, uh, including John, and uh, I'm sure it's much more interesting. Fadi, if you roll, I see a whole a gang of people I know. I won't start because then I won't stop. Uh, but uh, as I sometimes tell uh, my mother, I'm the only person here I don't recognize. Uh, but I do want to just start by saying one thing that's, uh, it's separate from today's events, but it's, it's, uh, it's actually quite relevant. And that is to note, as many of us uh, well know, that uh, uh, the nation uh, and many of us personally lost a dear friend recently, uh, and that's Dr. Jim Schlesinger, former Secretary of Energy, great friend to CSIS, a great American patriot, head of the Atomic Energy Commission, head of the CIA, head of the Pentagon, and the first Secretary of Energy. So if I could just ask people to take a moment of silence to honor uh, Jim's memory, I would appreciate it. So. Thank you. Um, Somebody said the mark of true fame is when uh, people know you that you don't know. So I first met Secretary Schlesinger when he was Secretary of Defense, and I was the note taker in the Science Center at Harvard at I think what they called the Godkin Lecture. And he gave a speech, the title of which I think was called The Seamless Web of Deterrence. And people will remember this is when we were trying to move away from mutual assured destruction and having uh, a much more graduated set of options uh, for purposes of assuring that our uh, nuclear deterrent would be as credible uh, as, as possible. Uh, and just recently, within the last couple of months, I would say, uh, Jim came in and had lunch with Secretary Moniz and me, and he, um, uh, he verified a story that I heard many times, and I'll just take a minute because it's a, it's, it's a true story and a good one, uh, and it's this. Uh, he was, as many people remember here, the uh, senior energy advisor to President Carter uh, before he became the first Secretary of Energy. And in fact, he had that great misfortune that happens to people of appearing on the cover of Time Magazine in a Superman costume, which is usually really bad luck. And uh, in any event, uh, he became the first Secretary of Energy. And uh, he wrote down on a single sheet of paper uh, a statement that the real property at the location of a thousand independent Southwest uh, should be made the headquarters of the newly uh, created Department of Energy right there uh, on uh, Independence Avenue. Beautiful view facing the Smithsonian Castle. At that time occupied, as my recollection serves, by the US Army Corps of Engineers. Takes this thing into the Oval Office, gives it to President Carter, Dr. Brzezinski, who tell us if it's either true or credible. And uh, it's a one sentence thing as I've just described it. And uh, with a box approved, disapproved, President Carter checks the box. Uh, when the Secretary of Defense, Harold Brown, found out about this, he said, Jim, what do you do? Why would you show the President a memo like that taking my building without showing me first? And he said, why, Harold, you know you would have objected. <laughs> so back in those days when I was taking notes uh, for people like Secretary Schlesinger giving lectures, there was a big debate. This is at the time of the first oil shocks, and we had all of these academic discussions. Is energy merely a commodity, and you should just live, let the neutral uh, forces of supply and demand uh, allocate resources accordingly, or is it a strategic asset that has to be dealt with from a national security perspective somewhat differently? We've been through the first oil price shock, 73, 79, this debate is raging. Look, I think everyone is clear now that energy is fundamentally and deeply a strategic asset, and we need to view it uh, in such terms, and, and we certainly do, and I think history is full of uh, areas where major muscle movements uh, have occurred around the world of people making uh, major decisions uh, that have uh, been deeply informed by uh, acquisitive energy strategies, uh, only the most uh, uh, notorious of which is Saddam Hussein's seizure of the uh, oil fields down in Kuwait. So I think that debate is, is largely over. And uh, certainly the United States has uh, taken the view uh, that we need to be energy secure. President Obama has been very articulate about that. I invite uh, many of you have already seen it, but to look at the speech he gave at Georgetown a couple of years ago where he talked about that. And in fact, uh, if you look at the president's overall energy policy, 
it is, I think, deeply informed by this desire to be energy secure and to be energy, energy diverse in a manner that promotes our security. So the all of the above strategy, which I think you've all heard of, that uh, characterizes the President's approach to the development of U.S. energy resources, I think uh, clearly is one that promotes uh, diversification and therefore security of our fuel supplies. Now, uh, as has been written about and, and discussed now at length, in our own case, the all of the above strategy with the incredible prodigious outpouring of oil and gas that recent years have witnessed have really quite substantially transformed our own energy security and, by the way, to the benefit of countries around the world. Uh, I will merely, in this very expert uh, audience, cite a couple of very brief factoids having gone from only on the order of 1% of our gas production uh, coming from shale gas in 2001, we're now up to 40%, and this on an annual gas economy on the order of, uh, on the order of 23 trillion cubic feet. So it's, it's had a tremendous effect, and of course, that has had the effect we've all seen on gas prices coming down, which has uh, meant that all of the expectations that we had had and the people have written about about LNG imports have now turned turned into a discussion about LNG exports which has taken a lot of the heat off of ga natural gas prices in Europe so it's already provided some substantial relief and then of course uh, more recently but also incredibly impressively our oil production is going up on the order of a, bil a million barrels per day year on year so and I, I don't know if Adam Siminski is here to give me the third decimal place but uh, to the order of magnitude we were at six and a half million barrels per day production last year, about seven and a half million barrels per day this year. We're heading towards 8.5 next year, uh, well, practically a million barrels per day uh, out of the Bakken alone. And uh, this has also had a tremendous uh, uh, and positive effect on our economy, on our energy security. So uh, we are witnessing in practice the, the strength of uh, energy diversification. And um, the president has also been very clear that uh, this is uh, an issue that extends throughout uh, the platforms of uh, power generation. Uh, certainly uh, the uh, incredible increase we've seen in the various renewable forms of energy has been uh, quite impressive. And we have the first nuclear power plants to be built commercially in the United States in three decades, uh, supported in the case of the Vogel reactors by the uh, loan guarantee authority of which six and a half uh, a billion dollars have now been uh, drawn from, and Secretary Moniz went down to Vogel to, to celebrate that milestone. So we have seen uh, that uh, in terms of the United States, our security has been very much enhanced uh, by the diversification of our supplies. It brings us not only uh, security benefits and the reduced vulnerability that uh, uh, our own uh, production has permitted, but also, as I said, has provided, I think, serious security benefits to our allies and trading partners as well. And this is important because it goes to how we think about energy security. We think about energy security in terms of a positive asset, uh, something to uh, develop and to share and to trade and to uh, uh, allow the countries of the world to, to benefit because all of us are uh, ultimately tied in so many dimensions uh, by shared bonds of uh, uh, security interests and interest in uh, protecting the environment of this small planet that I think all of uh, these uh, areas will continue to flourish as we are able to, to pursue this uh, diversification strategy that has been so successful in the United States of America. It's also very important to note that we view security in a broader sense than just production. And uh, energy security also means security against all forms of threat, natural and unnatural. So if you look at the President's Climate Action Plan, not only is the first pillar of that climate action plan dedicated to a mitigation strategy which does talk about the development, the responsible and sustainable development of all uh, elements of our energy equation including and, and very significantly so uh, energy efficiency and reducing demand uh, for uh, energy where we can be uh, smarter about the way we insulate buildings, the greater use of uh, uh, appliance standards to drive efficiency in, in, in that realm, the uh, fuel economy standards have all of which have uh, lowered the demand side of the equation, which is equally effective and, and in many cases, as we say, it's the cheapest uh, megawatt to build is the megawatt that you don't need to build. Uh, but uh, we have also seen that um, the importance of the second pillar of the President's Climate Action Plan 
on adaptation is also very much tied to our security. And uh, we had this brought home searingly to all of us in the case of Hurricane uh, Sandy. And we found deep vulnerabilities, uh, particularly vulnerabilities that we had not thoroughly processed, to be candid, uh, between the fuel sector and the electric sector. And here I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the tremendous leadership, thought leadership of John Hess, who you'll hear from shortly, who uh, I, I call him professor. Uh, he was ahead of me in school a little bit, but I really learned a lot from John in that experience about exactly how uh, those two sectors interact. And, and let me say it is a work in progress, but we have become incredibly focused, and the president is incredibly focused on the importance of resilience. And I will, I will pivot off that uh, to make one other point here. Uh, at the time of uh, Hurricane Sandy, the uh, president was very, very clear. He said that after preservation of life and limb, that restoration of power, we had eight and a half million people out of power, was his highest priority. And the second thing he said is he would have zero tolerance for red tape. And this mobilized the level of effort between the public sector and the private sector, which we are trying to now build out of an improvisation to something that's more systemic. Uh, but it led to a series of conversations, not only within the government, but between the government and the private sector. And that conversation went beyond uh, just storm response. And in fact, when President Obama came to the Department of Energy in May uh, 2013, to discuss with the CEOs of the major electrical utilities, not just East Coast, by the way, this is coast to coast, what lessons need to be learned and how they could be applied in the future. The conversation turned to cyber because people recognize that the threats that we are facing are not just natural disasters, they can be unnatural disasters. They can be uh, visited by a very sophisticated cyber attack. And as we learned, in Silicon Valley last April, it can come in the form of a rifle attack on a transformer. So we have a holistic, integrated view of energy security, which is something that I think is relevant to countries around uh, the world. Now, John admonished me not to talk either too long, which I perhaps have done already, uh, or uh, too much about Ukraine, but I just will say the following. The third pillar of the Climate Action Plan is international cooperation. And uh, it turns out that fits very well with the other two pillars. It, felt, it fits very well with the all of the above strategy. And what we have seen in the recent weeks uh, following the episodes that we're all discussing in Ukraine and Crimea is a deepening of that conversation and an important deepening of that conversation. Last, I think it was just last week, I had the opportunity to meet uh, in the US EU Energy Council, Secretary Kerry and I, uh, were on the U.S. side and Lady Ashton and, and Gunther uh, Ettinger on the EU side. And it was a very useful conversation about the development and the responsible development of uh, our resources individually and collectively. And this is an issue that the President has, uh, has spoken to. And I think uh, I could not do better than to uh, quote the President's words and how he thinks about some of these issues because I think it will usefully inform our conversations. And the President said on his recent trip to Europe, I think it is useful for Europe to look at its own energy assets as well as how the United States can supply additional energy assets. Because the truth of the matter is that just as there's no easy, free, simple way to defend ourselves, there's no perfect, free, ideal, cheap energy sources. Every possible energy source has some inconveniences or downsides. And I think that, I'm continuing the quote here, I think that Europe collectively is going to need to examine in light of what's happened their energy policies to find are there additional ways that they can diversify and accelerate energy independence. The United States as a source of energy is one possibility and we've been blessed by some incredible resources. But we're also making choices and taking on some of the difficulties and challenges of energy development and Europe is going to have to go through some of those same conversations as well. Uh, that's what the President said in The Hague. And so what we're talking about for both the United States, for Europe and beyond, is a diverse set of solutions. And uh, that's the conversation that we're having. Uh, that's why the President asked Secretary Moniz to participate with other G7 energy ministers in a conversation about energy security. What can we do uh, in that context? It's a global conversation. It's being pursued through multiple channels, as we mentioned, through the US-EU channels now uh, soon to uh, happen in the form of a ministerial that will 
uh, lead to a report to the G7 leaders as well. It's a great moment of opportunity. There's the famous uh, cliche, but most cliches have something uh, of the truth uh, in them of never let a, gr a great uh, crisis go as a missed opportunity. I'm sure there's a more eloquent way of saying that and has been by Rahm Emanuel. So. Uh, but in any event, I think that's how we look at this moment. Uh, we have uh, tremendous challenges that we face, but it is also an opportunity to reset the terms of the discussion. And if I may say, I can't think of a better place than CSIS and the people who I see, uh, many of whom I've had the pleasure to work with and learn from all these years, to have that conversation. It has to be an open conversation uh, where we talk about things that are uh, both possible but things that are difficult. And uh, as we go through this conversation, I am confident that we will emerge the stronger for it and that we will find, uh, just as the United States has found its strength in security through diversity, that others will as well. We are very, very sharply focused on ensuring that uh, Ukraine uh, receives the assistance that it needs in this critical moment. We're very, very focused as well on other portions of Europe that have become quite dependent on imported uh, gas supplies. But we're also focused globally on how this presents opportunities and challenge for all of us and how by working together we can emerge with a stronger uh, level of security against external threats to our sovereignty, to our economic prosperity, and how we can do this in a way that actually promotes our own prosperity, creates great jobs, creates new industries, which we have uh, already seen in great uh, measure so far, and do so at the same time that we lower carbon in the uh, service of a long-term plan to keep this planet uh, as uh, uh, stewards for the next generation so that they can enjoy uh, the bounty that Providence has provided this uh, small planet, but one that is the only one we've got to live in. So with that, uh, I think there's some time for Q&A, and I wanted to just say to everybody here again, thank you for all that you're doing, not just today, but every day. Thank you. We do have a few minutes for some questions before the Secretary has to leave, so let me ask people that would like to pose it, and we've got some microphones around here we'll catch real quickly. Let me walk over here to get it to you. Thank you. Uh, I'm David Bardeen. I served with Jim Schlesinger in President Carter's energy establishment. My question has to do with the President's emergency powers and what review the administration has made of them. If you conceive of an emergency in which the President concludes that to help one or more allies, we need to do something extraordinary, such as overriding contractual arrangements temporarily to make crude oil or refined petroleum products conceivably natural gas, directly or indirectly, available, does the President have all the powers he needs? Has the administration reviewed the powers he has and may not have? And has it informed Congress of what powers the administration believes the President has and any defects? And I just give you an analogy, if you think back to the Berlin blockade, under very different circumstances, because we were an occupying power then, President Harry Truman, sent coal by airplane to Tempelhof to save the Berliners from that blockade. Well, I only consider myself a recovering lawyer, and uh, I, I haven't practiced law uh, since, I think, 2000, uh, and I'm not at the White House anymore, but I, so I'll limit myself to some rather uh, general observations. What I recall is that the President does have a quite robust emergency authorities on such things as the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, IEP, and so forth. But I would not it would be remiss of me to try to parse any of that here. What I will say is this, that we are focusing in the first instance uh, not in uh, a sort of dry uh, legalistic analysis of what the powers are, but actually rolling up our sleeves and solving the problem. So uh, just as we've been working very hard to support the IMF in uh, developing the program that will support Ukraine. We've been working very closely with the Europeans on the package that they're putting together. We've passed our own package through the, the, the U.S. Congress. So what we're focusing on now is in the first instance, uh, and, and we have uh, fortunately the situation of a not overly harsh winter and, and high uh, storage of uh, natural gas in the region, uh, we, we are uh, trying to make sure that in the first instance the Ukrainians themselves and second in interest 
uh, instance, countries like the Visegrad Four that are uh, on the other side of the pipes, uh, that uh, they have what they need. We've looked at things like reverse pipeline flows. Uh, we've looked at uh, other storage measures. Actually, there are some, some things. It's not easy given the nature of the energy infrastructure in Ukraine uh, to look at some conservation measures. There's a variety of things that are being looked at. I'm sure that the lawyers uh, who are working with us are looking to see uh, what uh, powers and authorities uh, can be used uh, if need be, but uh, I, I have not directly been uh, involved in, in, in that conversation. Dan, let me pose a question on, uh, on behalf of people here, and that is, uh, you didn't have a chance to see the chart, but our colleagues, uh, Sarah Ladislaw and Marn Lead, showed a, an interesting chart that showed price differentials for natural gas. Our Japanese colleagues pay four and a half times as much as we pay. Our European colleagues pay three and a half times or three times as much as we do. Wouldn't it be good for everybody if we could start exporting gas? I mean, it would help. It would help our Japanese colleagues get their prices down and their productivity up. It would help our European colleagues with security, and we'd get we'd make money. Uh, it's a great question. So let me just put that in uh, uh, a little context. First of all, as I said, uh, even before any natural gas gets exported. Uh, the fact that all those LNG import terminals are not getting used has taken a lot of pressure off of gas demand in, in terms of imports to the United States and, and provided relief already. Uh, and by the way, uh, also driving down coal prices, uh, coal exports to Europe also bringing a lot of cheaper energy. So the United States, even before you get to the question, which I'm, I promise I'm about to get to, is doing a lot to support energy security uh, in Europe, point one. Point two, you know, there will be a limit uh, below which you, you will not see, my hunch is I would defer to John Hess, uh, natural gas ever become commoditized to the degree that oil is because the fungibility will never be the same uh, because of the transportation cost, five or six bucks uh, per MBTU. So I think you're going to see some continuing delta. That's the second point. The third point is, uh, again, I think most people here know, uh, having gone from expecting to be a major import of LNG. In May 2011, we issued our first export license for LNG, and we have now, we're now up to seven, including the most recent just a couple of weeks ago, that together, and these are conditional approvals with the exception of the first one, which has gone final, that if they go through the final approval, we'll make available 9.3 billion cubic feet uh, of LNG exports available per day. Uh, and it, for those Europeans out there, that's on the order of like 95 BCM per year. Uh, and uh, roughly speaking, again, I'm careful to note these are conditional so far, uh, but that's on the order of what Europe now imports in terms of LNG. It's on the order of what Qatar exports. It's about half of what Russia imports. So, so uh, I think we're already moving significantly into that space. And uh, we're going to continue under the Natural Gas Act to apply the criteria that, uh, that you've, I'm sure, all seen in terms of looking at the overall effect as we're required by law, including the macroeconomic effects uh, of our uh, LNG exports. And uh, we look at trade balance, we look at employment, we look at, we look at geostrategic factors as well. So I think uh, you're seeing already the benefits of what the U.S. has done. And I think in terms of exports, it's already, I think, a very significant story. I'm probably for one more question before the secretary has to leave, if there is one, and otherwise we'll give him an early out. Yeah. Sarah? Thank you so much for being here. You know, uh, y you weren't able to be at part of the morning discussion, but one of the things that we talked a lot about is sort of U.S. perception of what sort of our new energy posture means for us, but then also international perception of what our new energy posture means for us. And a lot of times, you know, you know, I work in the energy space, but we brought in a lot of our foreign policy colleagues to talk about what it means for sort of the foreign policy implications. And quite honestly, there was a lot of anxiety, right? But you talk with a lot of folks from around the world who, you know, give you their perspective on sort of what this new uh, resource optimism for the United States is. If you could think, you know, quickly about whether or not there's a 
you know, there, there are some points of optimism and some points of anxiety and how you sort of think about those things, I think it'd be very enlightening for yeah. everybody. Well, let me say this, uh, it's a great question. For me, the principal point of optimism, I think this is Lee and Stephens who said, I've seen the future and it works. I'm not sure it panned out in the specific case that he cited, but in any event, uh, that is how I feel. In other words, we've all been in these conversations for years and years and years. And I, I can tell you, I for one did not foresee what has happened in this country. And in terms of, uh, I can't remember who came up with the phrase, now natural gas is not so much discovered as manufactured. And, and the really tremendous upside potential, and of course it's many of those same technologies that have led to this uh, also prodigious outpouring of, of oil. But even in that optimistic point, there is a note, I won't say of anxiety because that would not be the right thing to display, uh, but I will say in terms of caution, which is we can't take anything for granted. Uh, we do what we do under appropriate widespread public scrutiny. What we do, we have to do in a manner that supports and promotes and preserves public confidence. And it is no secret that there are uh, countries around the world that have gotten themselves tied up in moratoria, uh, where they're not able to develop some of these resources. Uh, it is obvious that in the post-Fukushima uh, era, uh, that if you are not a good steward of nuclear safety, that the promise of low carbon electricity in large base load units uh, will not be something you can rely on. Obviously, Japan has shut 50 reactors. And so I think the note of optimism is that the source of security is present and widespread, point one. Point two, that in thinking about energy not as a weapon, not as something to use coercively, not as something to deny, but as something to support, as something to support our own independence, as something to support our allies, as something to support our trading partners and our friends. There is great cause for optimism that not just our individual security, but our collective security will be enhanced. The cautionary note is uh, I'd say twofold. Number one, uh, and you heard it from the president, none of us, I think, has the luxury to say, I'm some of the above. I'm looking at this, I'm not looking at that. I think we all of us, it would not be the right thing to expect one country to be the sole provider of one particular energy source, and that's not a terribly secure way to go anyway, even though we would not use uh, energy in the way that it is sometimes contemplated. But I think that's why we have to have a frank and candid conversation about natural gas and its use elsewhere in the world, about nuclear and its use elsewhere in the world. And we have to recognize that decisions that are made in one country will profoundly affect decisions made in other countries and that even uh, entities that are completely responsible and transparent and uh, developing an energy resource can be adversely effect, affected by others who are less so. And so that means I think we really have a common interest in, in deepening uh, the dialogue that we have on, on many of these uh, energy uh, resources. So I think that um, the last thing I'll say on that, which is the second one I was gonna make on this point, is the way you preserve that public confidence is, and this is where I'm, I'm proud of the Department of Energy, we're a science and technology based agency. We need good science. We need good data. We need honest conversations uh, about uh, how to make sure that, just to take the, the shale gas ex example, how that resource can be developed by, uh, in ways that are mindful of air quality and water quality issues, that are mindful of the concerns that people have about fracking fluids and their uh, chemical uh, constituents, that are mindful of uh, overall water usage issues and clean completions. So all of these things I think are legitimate issues that need to be discussed and openly and frankly and that people have to come to terms with because if we are going to continue to enjoy this, this bounteous uh, outpouring of energy which lowers prices and, and brings all these other great economic effects, we're gonna have to uh, step up our game frankly. Uh, and, and this is not a public thing or a private thing, it's a public-private thing. So we've had conversations with the National Petroleum Council about how to do this and to think intelligently about governance because the industry can do a lot 
uh, on its own. So I would say the optimism is in the widespread uh, availability of resources that can solve problems all around the world. The cautionary note is uh, if we are not wise stewards of the development of those resources, that we may not always achieve the, the uh, ultimate payoff that we'd otherwise hope for. Colleagues, with, would you please thank Dan Poneman with your applause? And we're grateful to have him with us today. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay. Appreciate it.